Um, our first speaker is Laura Wexler. Laura is Professor of American Studies, Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, Professor of Film and Media Studies at Yale University. She's a busy person. Um, <laughs> Professor Wexler is, is co-director of Yale Public Humanities, founding director of Yale's Photographic Memory Workshop, a member of the steering committee of the Feminist Technology Network, and principal investigator of the Photogrammer Project. Um, she has served as chair of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program and co-chair of the Yale Women's Faculty Forum. Professor Wexler has an undergraduate degree from Sarah Lance College and MA, MPhil, and PhD degrees from Columbia University. Welcome, Professor thank Wexler. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, uh, so, all right, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, in the summer of 1935, economist Rexford Tugwell, who was a former Columbia University professor of economics um, and the current head of the Roosevelt administration's resettlement administration, created an information division for his agency. And he appointed to that information division another younger university, Columbia University economist, Roy Stryker to lead its historical section. That was going to be a public relations unit. The need was dire. The Resettlement Administration had replaced the Agricultural Adjustment Administration after the former agency had created an unforeseen crisis on top of the already critical situation of American agriculture in the Depression. By paying farmers to reduce agricultural production, the earlier government agency had successfully raised commodity prices, which was its goal, but simultaneously, it started pushing small farmers and sharecroppers out of their livelihood, which was its unintended consequence. Family farms were being hit by a triple whammy. Modernization brought large-scale industrial farming with which it was difficult to compete. Loss of American market share to European farms that were now recovering from the devastation of World War I brought further competition. An extensive and extended drought combined with inexpert land management brought the ecological emergency of the Dust Bowl. Hundreds of thousands of formerly independent farm families were being rapidly thrown into the migrant transitory labor market. The Reed Settlement Agency, like other New Deal agencies, was set up to mitigate the damage, and Roosevelt's enemies in Congress were poised to stop it. The main job of the historical division of the Resettlement Administration, therefore, was to practice a public relations policy that would be as potent as possible. The task was bureaucratic. They were to supply media with photographs that showed the success of the government's programs. Stryker hired an extraordinary group of photographers, including Dorothea Lang, Walker Evans, Gordon Parks, and sent them out on field assignments to do this work. They would work basically on the jobs he scripted, but in the interstices he promised, they would be able to take a day here, a day there. That's part of why they signed up for the government job, because you could do that, to explore material that particularly interested them. This is where, as he later would put it, they conspired with him to get what history has proved to be the guts of the project. Ultimately, the greatest success of the historical division of the Re Resettlement Administration accomplished its goals of introducing Americans to Americans, but not only during the Great Depression, but also long after. In fact, when we in the 21st century want to look back and see who we once were in order to picture and assess who we are now becoming, it is very often to the FSA Photographic Archive that we turn. The FSA photographs represent the largest, indeed the only, large-scale government-sponsored documentary project in United States history. The nearly 170,000 surviving photographs of the more than 250,000 in the agency produced in the 10 years between 1935 and 1945 reside at the Library of Congress, where access to them is public and rights of reproduction are essentially free. They are also available for search and download on the Library of Congress website. They are widely recognized as one of the treasures of the American people. Arguably, the FSA photographers were more successful than the agencies they were created to support. The baseline idea was to improve the lives of marginal farmers by 
purchasing submarginal land and relocating individual and often isolated families to better land on group farms where economies could be more efficient and scientific expertise could be learned, shared and consolidated. Aggressively attacked by congressional critics as collectivized our agriculture, the movers and shakers of the resettlement administration were very often on a defensive. Their budgets were repeatedly slashed. Instead of success, in Tugwell's original goal of moving 650,000 people sustainably onto 100 million acres of what was becoming of, of new land, they were only able to move a few thousand people um, onto 9 million acres. Instead, they were forced to build about 75 relief camps in California, where about 775,000 destitute migrants who were entirely un, almost entirely unwelcome in the state were temporarily housed in clean quarters with running water. They also built a few greenbelt model cities for a future that never came. In 1936, facing widespread criticism, Rexford Tugwell, Rexford Tugwell resigned. And in 1937, the resettlement administration was transferred to the Department of Agriculture and the Farm Security Act transformed it into the Farm Security Administration. One can, and many have and do, argue the relative value of the farming programs. One particularly stinging criticism concerns the basic structural and also actively overt racism that underlay the project often, creating disparities in who was portrayed as the deserving poor, whose histories on the land were envisioned and respected and whose were erased, and who received relief. Key FSA programs removed former tenants and replaced them with FSA clients throughout the Mississippi Delta, both black and white, but racial segregation was accepted. Black clients at the time were unable to challenge such policies, but it has also been argued that the agency itself created the ideological and practical infrastructure through which the black farmers would eventually challenge the white supremacy of resettlement. This documentary project, however, the photographic project, is generally considered to be an astounding success. If the more than 170,000 extant and widely beloved photographs contain exculpatory or contradictory evidence about the intentions and effects of New Deal policies, it is very difficult, however, to turn it up. The FSA archive is a very large, very messy data set. Enter Photogrammer a digital research tool supported by the NEH and the ACLS and developed at Yale by the Photogrammer team. The team consists of two co-directors, former Yale graduate students Taylor Arnold in statistics and Lauren Tilton in American Studies, and they're both at the, now at the University of Richmond. Stacy Maples, former GIS librarian at Yale and now at the David Rumsey Map Center at Stanford University. Kenneth Panko, former Yale technologist now at Yale and US. Peter Leonard, Yale's first digital humanities librarian and head of the DH lab in Sterling Memorial Library, Trick Kirkpatrick, technologist in Yale's teaching and learning laboratory, and myself, after six years, profoundly a digitally, humanist, a digitally human, enhanced humanist. I am the principal investigator of the Photogrammer project. One intervention that we immediately made and, um, and um, was to re, re, was to create a, a oops, a web-based, many-layered interactive geospatial map to render this archive fluently searchable. And you see the um, you see in this slide the the mapping um, that resulted. And when we did this, absolutely immediately we overturned the first sort of stereotypical truism that scholars have since the 1930s been repeating about this project, which is that it is uh, about Appalachia and the Dust Bowl. The minute that you map the photographs, what you find is that it's a project of national scope and that it covers um, um, uh, not only, you know, from Maine to Florida, there's even sites offshore, but also um, the old industrial cities as well as the uh, as well as the, the heartland and the farmland of the country. Um, and um, wh why this is and why it keeps getting repeated that really it's about Appalachia and the Okies moving west to California is something that I believe that mapping and studying the FSA archive as a big messy data set will eventually allow us to um, learn about. So let me just give you a kind of a quick tour and slides of the website. 
Um, you will recognize many of these photographs. They are, um, are, are not only our cultural heritage, but our cultural imaginary of who we were during the uh, Great, um, Great Depression. These are Walker Evans's photographs um, of the sharecroppers in, that were published in the uh, book Let Us Now Praise Famous Men that he co-authored with James Agee. Um, this is the um, office um, uh, of um, uh, the, the, the women, actually, in the back offices who were um, uh, categorizing and tagging uh, the hundreds of thousands of photographs as they came in under the auspices of a brilliant uh, librarian named Paul Vanderbilt. This was Vanderbilt's first effort at uh, tagging, uh, actually creating categories for visual categories uh, for uh, photographs. Um, he went on to head the Wisconsin Historical Society and do incredible work there. But these, these are um, the, the labor force behind what Vanderbilt was doing, um, who, and they are anonymous. Um, the FSA files exist in red file cabinets in the Library of Congress now as um, analog um, objects, material objects. And um, they also exist online in the Library of Congress um, website, but both of these are very, very difficult to search. In 2001, I was part of a small group of scholars brought to the Library of Congress to search physically through these drawers um, and find, um, find interesting information about the FSA photographs that we didn't already know. And out of the, I think, probably eight or nine of us, um, um, very little new interesting information resulted from that because you, in, even in a week of looking, um, it's too unwieldy, it's too difficult, there are too many factors, there's too much information um, to search that way. And this is one of the reasons that the Photogrammer project got started. So here's a <clears throat> the map and, um, and um, we, um, we also made, um, we also took 10 of the, um, I think it's 10, uh, primary, um, most famous, most well-known photographers and gave them colors and trace, tracked their um, trail across the country. Um, and we interleaved this with a 1937 um, highway map. Um, so because um, if you're looking for sort of mystified or occluded political choices in where the FSA was doing its work. One of the ways to sort of try to figure that out is to see whether the people doing field work were following the main transportation routes, were going um, on, on the back roads, were uh, relating to minority communities or not, and it's the road map that can tell you that. We also discovered this, uh, the, the, uh, the blue dots that we first thought were um, Route 66 going west, it's actually a train. Um, it's not Route 66 at all. Okay, um, so, um, okay, so yeah, that, so that's the trip going west. Um, um, we really threaded the needle in terms of a digital humanities project with the Photogrammer project because this is open access, open data that's owned by the people of the United States. And so we were able, with the tremendous, tremendous, wonderful, willing cooperation of the Library of Congress, we were willing to, we were able to work with the beautifully digitized um, photographs that they twice did in two different generations of digital capacity um, and um, put online and um, with the metadata that they um, also, as wonderful librarians, kept attached. This is public open information. When we've presented this project in other uh, fora, other, other, peop other groups of people have have said, well, could we do, could we do photogrammer on our, the U.S. Uh, Holocaust Memorial um, Museum had wanted to do um, the, a photogrammer kind of a map with letters and photographs and information that people were sending them, 
But it turns out that it's a there are restrictions on the information. It's a proprietary archive. It can't, it can't, it, there, there's again and again and again, people contact us. We say all of our coding, all of our information is on GitHub. It's all free for you. Talk to us. We're happy to help you. And they cannot do this work because the, uh, what, what do you want to call it, foresight or happen chance or whatever it is of the government in 1936 made this a public archive. Okay, um, so um, the, um, all right, and so you see, um, you see something we've circled here on the attached metadata called lot number. Um, and that has to do with the original coding system that Vanderbilt in that room of workers um, was doing. And we also uh, coordinated, um, we, we got uh, a hold of uh, Vanderbilt's um, key handbook and we coordinated his categories with these photographs so that we can see how he and the government and the general media were thinking of this portrait of uh, Americans at the time. Uh, one of the categories we actually love is people as such without <laughs> emphasis on their activity. That is actually one of his categories, people as such. Um, I think this may be one of the people as such. <laughs> um, but what you see is that actually you also have, you, you have be, because these photographs are publicly owned, scholars of the United States have gone to this archive to get images for their books and articles without much expense and without you can always get permission and what that means is there's been a kind of I don't know what a scientist would call it, but a high replication effect of a limited number of uh, of uh, photographs and so we actually only know a small amount of uh, what the images are in this archive and every single time I open up Photogrammer, I find new images. Um, okay. Um, we, um, one of the innovations of Photogrammer, okay, so what Stryker and the team were doing in the 1930s was turning data into images. The government had data, were the agencies working, and he was turning it into images so that Americans could see and understand who one another are. What we have done with those images is to turn them back into data which gives us now another way of searching, combining, inquiring, um, and um, understanding um, the, na the nature of this photographic system and how it applies to um, our political past and our current situation. This is Vanderbilt's, um, this is a tree map we made of Vanderbilt's 1942 classification system. You can see people as such. You go, you drill down in it, into it in, in three segments um, and you see um, you see what they're looking for horse shows the circus uh, dance orchestras groups singing this is the way they are thinking of a portrait of the country is it our portrait of the country no what's interesting is the difference between that portrait of the country and our portrait of the country okay um, I want to just I, I'm going to go very quickly through and hope to show you one more thing um, there are color ones hardly anybody knew that um, we have been using facial recognition um, to kind of categorize the photographs. This is n n not very theoretically well substantiated. We are looking um, for kind of, um, I don't know, um, morphological features um, and trying to see what kind of, we're just experimenting with the images and trying to see what kind of um, what kind of pictures we get, and can we actually find more African Americans, visible African Americans, this way? Um, and then finally, I want to show you, uh, tell you a, a, a story uh, that that would never have happened if it wasn't a group, this kind of a group, this kind of a totally interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary group with technologists, a digital humanities librarian. Me, I'm a historian of photography, somebody who had worked in museums, a statistician, a GIS expert. This is our team. We were in Washington and talking to the um, uh, Beverly Bannon, who's the chief curator of this archive. We were around a table, and Taylor Arnold, the statistics graduate student, at the, he, he, he finished his PhD, but at the time, um, was sitting in a corner, and he's looking at this number 
this number, call number, la 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 la, dash M4. And he says, what does that mean, M4? And the librarian says, we, I don't, we don't know. We don't know, but best practices are to keep the, keep the mark record, keep the metadata intact. So in all these years, the librarians in Congress did that. What is this M number? And what, um, what um, after thinking about it for a long time, Taylor and Lauren um, figured out is that M number, okay, the M number has to do with this. The, the government photographers were supplied by government supplies, and it was cheaper to give them large industrial roll film than the film that those of you that even remember film will remember, which used to come in 24 and 36 exposure rolls. So they had large rolls. Um, and they were um, constrained to go out in the field and, and shoot pictures and send the rolls of film back, home, back to Washington where a lab developed um, and printed them. And then, you know, there's a process of choosing. So the lab did this and it cut the rolls of film into about six or eight inch, eight, six or eight frame segments. When they were done, they threw the segments into a metaphorical pot. They were not interested in keeping the segments aggregated. They're looking for individual images to substantiate reports in government documents. So they threw these, okay. So what Taylor figured out is that the M number had to do with which frame it is on the negative strip. And when he was able to write a program that could reunify the negative strips. So here's an example, John Vachon in July of 1941. He's in Wisconsin and he's photographing cheese. Cheese, 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 <laughs> cheese, 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 right? Then there's a blank, there's a, there's a blank frame and that blank frame represents actually his crossing. The next frame is to Chicago where the next picture is a, is a down and out man um, sitting, um, I guess it's on a fire hydrant um, and then the, the, the train of thought, the shooting goes uh, to photographing that man. Now, th it's absolutely extraordinary. We've been able to reunify the, a certain number of these and we now have a grant. Taylor and Lauren are working on this in Richmond to reunify um, many, many more. But what you have here for now the historian is this question, why is the jump from stop cheese, then you can figure I'm tired of cheese, to um, <laughs> this man in Chicago. And the question for a depression historian, the question that arises here is that John, is John Vachon thinking we make so much cheese in this country? Wisconsin is not very far from Chicago. What is the reason we cannot get the cheese to the people who are hungry? Cheese now comes in um, aid baskets. Um, the, um, and I kind of wonder whether this is a kind of prehistory of that. But the question is a question that goes to the heart of the New Deal. Um, do we need a different kind of dis production and distribution system in order to get um, what is needed to the people who need it? Um, uh, uh, that's the question. So, all right. So, Roy Stryker's brilliant photographers transformed data into photographs. I've said that the brilliant photogrammer team has trans transformed these photographs back into data. The enduring question is, from a digitally enhanced humanist point of view, qui bono? Who benefits from this knowledge and how? Thank you.